Well, the first thing that we have to say is that this is the most serious, the deepest crisis, probably for 200 years. Even the uh, orthodox economists now admit it's the most serious crisis for 60 years. That is to say, the most serious crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. But I, I think it's far deeper than that. I don't think that there's ever been a crisis of these dimensions, perhaps in the history of, of capitalism. Uh, the cause of it, well, the first thing perhaps that I would like to point out is that this crisis should never have taken place, according to the orthodox economists, what I would call the bourgeois economists. They actually put forward a theory for the last uh, 30 or 40 years. They put forward a theory called the efficient market hypothesis, which is supposed to be a new theory, of course it's not new at all, it's, um, the old, it's a new version of what was known as Say's Law, which was around in Marx's day, and Marx answered that uh, particular idea at the time. The argument was that under capitalism, although we, we're not supposed to say capitalism now, you're supposed to say the free market economy, sounds much nicer. The argument was that the market, if it's left to itself, will automatically regulate itself and that therefore it's not possible to have a crisis of overproduction as Marx predicted because supply and demand will, will balance each other out. Now this is false. There is no such automatic regulator in the market system. On the contrary, the capitalist system has an inbuilt central contradiction which is overproduction which whereby constantly Production oversuits the narrow limits of the market, and this is precisely what you have at the present time. It was put rather well, actually, by um, not by a Marxist, uh, rather the opposite, by a, a bourgeois by the name of George Soros. You know, I, I have a little bit of respect for George Soros because, unlike the university uh, economists who understand precisely nothing, here is a man that does understand markets because he's made quite a lot of money out of them. And he said the following, he said, the, what you have under capitalism, what you have in the market, is not a kind of pendulum which swings in, in, a, in a regular fashion. What you have is a smashing ball, as on a building site. And that's what precisely we see at the present time. The whole world economy is in a state of absolute chaos. Uh, the equilibrium has been entirely destroyed, and they haven't got the faintest idea how to solve this. They can't even explain why the crisis exists. Uh, you know, there was a, a, a seminar held in London a few years ago. It was in 2009, actually. That's to say, uh, just a few months after the collapse of 2008. This was a seminar organised in the London School of Economics by The Economist magazine, which, as far as I know, is not, not particularly Marxist in its, in its outlook. But they invited the most prominent uh, economists, famous economists, to discuss only one question, what the hell is happening? You know, how do you explain this crisis? And there was one particular uh, intervention which, which um, uh, struck my attention by a very uh, famous economist by the name of Paul Krugman. Here's a man that actually won the, the Nobel Prize for Economics. And Krugman said the following at this se seminar, I was quite amazed at his frankness. He said, and I quote, For the last 30 years, macroeconomic theory has been, in the best case scenario, spectacularly useless, and in the worst case scenario, positively harmful. This is, for, this is from the horse's mouth, although perhaps I shouldn't mention horses after the food scandal that we've got in, in this country. Anyway. That's what he said. In other words, they've got no idea. Uh, the nearest that they can come to some, call, uh, some kind of an explanation is that they describe the crisis as a, as a crisis of credit. Uh, a, credit a, a credit crunch is the expression in English. Now this, frankly, is an explanation which explains nothing. You know, it reminds me of what, what Byron wrote in Don Juan, you know, explaining metaphysics to the nation. I wish he would explain his explanation. Uh, it explains nothing. 
Marx dealt with that. You know, they used the same explanation in Marx's day. That is, crises are caused by credit. Well, not so. Uh, the first thing one would have to ask uh, in, in dealing with this alleged explanation, a question which is never asked is, what is credit? You know, they never asked that. And all that credit is, Marx explained that a long time ago, all that credit is, it's a means whereby the capitalists, with the bourgeois, can avoid a crisis of overproduction by expanding the market beyond its natural limits. You know, and credit has been expanded colossally into an unheard of extent in the last period. Uh, if I'm just, I'm just speaking from memory, but I believe that the figures are correct. In 1964, if you take the United States, in 1964, the total credit, uh, public, private, and so on and so forth, company, so on, the total credit was $1 trillion. That's quite a lot, isn't it? In 2007, that's before the, uh, the collapse, it, it was $55 trillion. $55 trillion worth of credit just in the United States. You see how they try to expand uh, the market, expand demand in order to absorb the goods uh, and services which are being produced by artificial means. Now, of course, you know what happens when you get a credit card. There's a little bit of plastics that people, plastic that people carry around in their pockets. Marvellous thing, you know, a credit card. Marvellous thing. Because with a credit card, you don't need any money. You can buy a car or a holiday in the Caribbean or perhaps even a house, I don't know. No money is required. It's wonderful. Yes, it's wonderful, but it's got one slight problem, which you may see what it is. Sooner or later, you have to pay this back. And furthermore, you have to pay it back with interest. Now, it's true that the interest rate has been kept very low, but that's a problem. I'll come back to that in a moment. It was deliberately kept low, low for decades, particularly in the United States, by the, 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 the Federal Exchange. They deliberately kept this, uh, this uh, look, Greenspan, you know, Alan Greenspan was responsible for that policy. And of course, Greenspan was held up as the great white god. He was uh, widely praised for his wisdom in keeping interest rates low in boosting credit. Yes, the result of that particular lunacy, it was complete lunacy, was the credit, uh, uh, rather the housing bubble, colossal speculative bubble in the United States and other countries, for example in Ireland and Spain in particular, was affected by the same madness. And of course uh, this defies the law of gravity. Sooner or later it must be brought into line again. It must come down to earth. And it has come down to earth with a bang so that the expansion of credit was a means where they tried to avoid overproduction by expanding demand. Now you see the consequences, and the consequences are uh, more or less a catastrophe. Well, you ask for an example of overproduction. Well, I'll give you just one example. I think it's a very uh, striking example. The automobile industry. Of course, the economists now don't like to use the word overproduction. You know, it sounds a bit too much like Karl Marx. So they use another expression, they call it um, excess capacity. What is excess capacity? Well, it's just another way of saying overproduction. You know, Shakespeare, our great national poet, said many, many years ago, a rose with any other name will smell as sweet, and certain other substances with other names it will smell, smell as bad. You don't change something by changing the name, by the way. Anyway, they did change the name, so it's now excess capacity. So let's, uh, let's please them, let's uh, humour them by using the expression excess capacity. Okay. The automobile industry is, of course, a key industry because it entails all kinds of things. Beyond the automobile, beyond the production of cars and lorries and ambulances and trucks and bulldozers, it also involves steel, chemicals, plastics, paint, Woodwork, you, you name it, all kinds of things are entailed. So, the, so lots of industries are dependent on the automobile sector. But at this moment in time, as I am speaking, the excess capacity, the global excess capacity on a world scale for the automobile industry is approximately 
Okay, one third. But what does this mean? Well, it means that Volkswagen, Fords, General Motors, Fiat, Citroën, you name it, all these companies, they could close one third of all of their factories tomorrow and sack all the workers. And they still would not be able to sell all the cars which they're able to produce at what they consider to be a, a suitable rate of profit. And if you look at the car industry now, if you want to buy a car, it's quite good because there's cutthroat competition and so on. They can't sell the goods. Now I'll make a prediction. Unless and until they can clear this colossal uh, excess capacity, and unless and until they can get rid of this mountain of debt which is weighing like a milestone on demand, there is no solution to this crisis. We can't solve it. Uh, they argue that it's credit. Well, if that's the case, if it's credit that's the problem, then you could solve the problem quite easily by throwing money at it. And by God, they have thrown money at it. They've thrown trillions of dollars into the banks and so on, trying to get the banks to, to lend money, you know, to boost inv productive investment. The bankers argue, of course, they're doing okay, aren't they, the bankers? Everyone else is suffering as a result of this, but the bankers are continuing to pocket their uh, exorbitant, obscene bonuses that people begin to notice. But let's, let's leave the question of the bonuses to one side. They're not lending. I mean, even in Britain, the uh, conservative liberal government, David Cameron, are pleading and arguing and, and, and pressurizing the bankers and even complaining and and pushing and pressing the bankers to lend money. The bankers turn around and say, well, how can we lend money if people don't want to, don't want to borrow? Well, that's a fact. You know, families are up to here in debt. They, they're paying their debt back. Why should they want to borrow money? Even at a low, low rate of interest. And as for industry, what's the point? I ask you, what's the point in investing in, 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 in creating new productive capacity when they can't sell the goods which they're producing at the moment? So therefore, this, this of course, is not the answer. And I'll say now that all these trillions which they've spent, the government has have thrown at the banks. And by the way, that's not a bad little... Uh, little uh, earner, is it, you know? I mean, uh, if a worker, in a fact that he breaks a machine, you know, you know what's going to happen. He's going to get sacked and they'll charge him for the damage. But if a banker destroys the entire fabric of the world uh, financial system, then he's rewarded with trillions of taxpayers' money. Uh, where, where's the sense of that? Can you see it? I can't see it myself. But apart from anything else, apart from the, just, the injustice of it, it does not work. It has not, but all these trillions have been thrown down the drain. There is no result, there's no recovery. It's clear that there's no recovery. Well, you see, uh, you, you ask about mechanisms whereby, govern, whereby governments could solve the crisis. Well, if you ask me, do such mechanisms exist? I answer yes. Oh, yes. There are very definite, uh, clearly defined uh, mechanisms for getting out of a crisis. What are they? Well, for, let's have a look. First of all, you can uh, stimulate the economy by reducing the interest rate. Okay? That stimulates consumption and it increases the rate of profit and so on. The slight problem, however, that the, the rate of interest at the present time is near to zero. So how can you reduce that? You're going to have a negative rate of interest? It, that, that means that banks will pay me to take out a loan. I can't I mean, the bankers are maybe a bit crazy, but they're not that crazy. So that particular avenue is because they, they, they've used it up. The other means would be, by, would be by, by increasing state expenditure. The state could spend its way out of the crisis, you know. This is what the Keynesians are arguing. They continue to argue this. Yes, but that doesn't make sense, either. Huh? As the right-wing point out, as the monetarist points out, they've got huge deficits. So how can you increase the, you increase state expenditure, you're increasing indebtedness, which is a colossal burden on the economy, and that's perfectly true. In other words, what I'm saying to you is that the mechanisms by which the bourgeoisie normally would get out of a crisis have already been used up. They've been used up in the last... They were used for the last 20 or 30 years irresponsibly 
by people like the American Federal Reserve and by Alan Greenspan in particular in order to avoid a crisis. Now you get the price. Now, as we say in English, the chickens have come home to roost. They can't use those mechanisms. And it's hard to see. They, they, they really do not know what to, to do. As far as giving money to the bankers, well, that is, that is really something, isn't it? You know? That is really something. Look, first of all, what was the main argument and what remains the main argument of the right wing of the bourgeois against socialism? Why do they defend capitalism? Well, the socialism doesn't work. Capitalism is the only system that works because it encourages, allegedly, you know, it encourages enterprise and, uh, and so on. Risk taking. That was the, you remember that argument, you know? Oh, I must get a profit. I must have a high rate of profit because I take a risk. Look, I could lose all my money. <laughs> Where's the risk? Where's the risk? Look, for 20 or 30 years, the bankers in particular were earning obscene profits out of speculation. It, 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 it was actually robbery. You know, old Proudhon used to say property is theft. Well, that's not very scientific, but nevertheless, in this case, <laughs> you could say that he was right. There was gigantic swindling and theft on a jail. By the way, nobody's gone to jail for this, not in Britain at least. Not a single person. They, these are far bigger robbers than the, 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 the great train robbers and so on and so forth. Now, the, here's an interesting point. You see, I remember that period. Most people will remember in the, in the uh, 90s and the 80s where vast profits were being made, obscene profits were being made in this huge carnival of uh, orgy of money making. Now I cannot remember, I don't know about you, but I cannot remember a single occasion when at that time a banker would stand up and say, hey look, look I'm making rather a lot of money. I think maybe we should give a little bit to the state, perhaps to maybe to build a few hospitals or money for the old age pensioners. Can you remember a banker ever saying that? No, I can't remember. I don't think any, a, a, such a speech was ever made. However, what, what they used to say, the state must stay out. You know that? The state must not interfere with the economy. There must be no regulation. They, they destroyed, they made a bonfire of all. There were some rules and regulations in Britain before Thatcher and so on. Controlling the banks to some extent to control speculation. They destroyed them. No, no, this was supposed to be an impediment against, uh, uh, you know, the market, against uh, free enterprise and so on. Okay, so as a result, you get this orgy of speculation. When it collapsed, as it inevitably uh, had to collapse, what did they say? They say, well, you know, we've made a loss too bad, you know. This is the market, this is free enterprise. Oh, no, no, no. Did they say the state must stay out? The government must, has got no role to play? They didn't say that at all. They went rushing to the state, to the government, with their hands outstretched, not asking for money, but demanding money. That's a criminal offence, you know, in this country, at least, to demand money with menaces. And that's what they did. And George W. Bush, who was in power in the States at the time, comes running with an open checkbook. This is an irony of history, you know. This man is... A, the Republican Party was the party of balanced budgets, strong dollar healthy finance, free enterprise, okay? He comes running with an open checkbook and says to the banker, yeah, guys, what do you want? How much do you want? You want a billion, take a billion. You want a trillion, take a trillion. And by God, they did. Same in Britain, I'm ashamed to say. With Gordon Brown, supposed to be a Labour leader, some Labour leader. He immediately goes and, and bails out the banks with, with, with huge amounts of money. The state... Therefore, all this argument against the state, the state has got no role to play. Let me put it this way. What is left today of private enterprise and the market? What's left? Well, all the major banks in the world and a large part of the big enterprises also are entirely dependent. They only exist thanks to handouts from the states. They depend upon the state like a cripple on crutches. What's left of the private enterprise system? What's left of this argument of risk? There is no risk, for goodness sake. If when you go down, you immediately get a huge bailout from the state. Now, this is really something. 
which nobody mentions. Everybody says, oh no, we've got to have austerity because there's a deficit. We must cure the deficit, you know. Not just the right-wing politicians, but the so-called left-wing politicians, the Social Democrats, who ironically are clinging to the market and capitalism when it's collapsing about their ears, you know. Now, you see, there's a character, a famous character in, in Britain called Robin Hood. You've heard of Robin Hood, you know. You know Robin Hood? Yes. Yeah, a long time ago. He, he stole from the rich to give to the poor. Okay? Quite a nice man, basically. Yeah? Nowadays, all the governments in the world are Robin Hood in reverse. They are stealing from the poor to give to the rich. Rich gangsters, I would go, I would add. Rich parasites, I would add. Talk about a productive role. Where's the productive role of any of these creatures? Well, what, 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 where's the necessity? It makes me laugh. You know, they see on the television, oh no, uh, we have to give, a, even in a crisis, when everyone is taking a cut, oh, we must pay a huge bonuses of millions of pounds to the bankers because we need to pay the best brains. Good heavens above. The best brains. These gangsters have just destroyed the entire world economy the, and we were rewarded them for failure. See, it does not make any sense from any point of view. But now, of course, we're stuck with it now. And what they're saying is, and nobody ever says this, you see, it's about time people did say. The Labour Party in Britain, the Social Democracy in Austria or whatever, surely somebody should have the guts to go on television and say, look, my friends, why should we, the ordinary people, the working class, the middle class, the oldest pensioner, the sick, why should we, who have least money, be subsidizing the banks for failure? Surely what ought to be done is that they should be nationalized, I would say nationalized, without a single cent of compensation. They should be made to pay money back. What do you mean compensation? When they've robbed us for decades. You know, it should be nationalized uh, under democratic workers' control without compensation. The banks and the finance houses and the big industries also, such that we could plan the economy with a planned economy, a democratic, a rationally planned economy. That's the only way really we, we, we can get the economy moving again. Because on the basis of capitalism, and by the way, they've admitted this, at least in Britain they admitted it, They've said the other day, it was on the, on the news, there is no way in which the middle and low income people in this country, and that goes for all other countries as well, they cannot even begin to recover their purchasing power until the year, what was it, 2024. Another 10 years, in other words, of falling living standards because the capitalist system does not work. Now, this, of course, uh, to me seems... Uh, apart from immoral, it seems to me to be highly irrational. Well, as far as the end of history is concerned, that was always a piece of nonsense, wasn't it? That was put forward by Francis Fukuyama 20 years ago, uh, at the time of the, just after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the argument then was, well, you see, because socialism doesn't work, because the Soviet Union has collapsed, well, it must be fair to Francis Fukuyama, he's not a complete idiot, not completely anyway, but anyway. But uh, what Fukuyama actually meant to say was not that history as such had ended. I mean, that's a, that's a silly thing to say. What he meant to say was something a bit different. He, what he meant to say was because with the collapse of the Soviet Union, it is demonstrated allegedly that socialism does not work. Therefore, the only possible alternative is capitalism. And therefore, the only possible system, socio-economic system, you can have is capitalism. And in that sense, history had ended. Yes, what he meant to say, in other words, is, is that uh, revolutions had ended, the class struggle had ended, and we were, we, as, uh, as uh, Leibniz would have said, we we're in the best, of all, best of, of, of all possible capitalist worlds. Yes, but you see, I would invite people now to have the, the, uh, the, the decency, have the courage, have the honesty to go back and read what they actually wrote 20 years ago. 
And it's quite instructive. Read what the defenders of capitalism and the social democrats and the economists, what they said 20 years ago. What did they promise us 20 years ago, after the collapse of the Soviet Union? They promised us uh, many things. They promised us a world of peace, you know, free from war because there was no longer any Cold War and so on. The economists talked about a peace dividend, you know, a world of prosperity thanks to the free market, the wonders of the free market economy and so on. Well, what's the position? Twenty years later, I think we have every right to say, as Marxists, twenty years later, and that's not a long time, two decades is not a long time in history, twenty years later, not one stone upon another is left of those delusions. On the contrary, just look at the position in the world. Peace. What peace when there's war after war after war? There's terrorism which is extending like a like some kind of medieval epidemic, un uncontrollable epidemic. The peace dividend, what's left of that? The United States now is spending every year, if I remember correctly, 800, more than $800 billion a year on arms. You know? And as for prosperity, we'll look at the position. It's collapsed. Mass unemployment everywhere, particularly in Europe, since we're in Europe which is now all eyes are on Europe, except that I would say the following. All eyes are on the crisis of Europe, and if that, it wasn't for the crisis of the Euro, which is not resolved, all eyes would be in the United States, where there's an even bigger deficit. They only narrowly escaped uh, a collapse just uh, a month and a half ago, when they, they stitched up some deal to prevent falling off a cliff, as they put it. Japan is in a mess. The whole world is in a mess if it comes to that, and they do not how to. They don't. They don't know how to resolve it. Well, I mean, the crisis in Europe, the crisis of European capitalism, is just a reflection of the general crisis of world capitalism. Except that in Europe, it's gone further than uh, than anywhere else, at least up to the present time. You have the crisis in Greece, which is not resolved. Greece is the weak uh, link. You know, Lenin said that capitalism breaks at its weakest link, of course. You wouldn't expect the crisis to begin in a country like Germany or Austria, which is just a satellite of Germany anyway. You'd expect it to begin precisely in the southern, the weaker capitalist countries, which it did. And uh, now you have the position in Greece, which is uh, a terrifying spectacle. You see, I, I know Greece quite well. I mean, I was in Greece, I've been travelling to Greece for many years. And I can tell you that just six, five or six years ago, the living standards in Athens, for example, were much different from the living standards here in London or any other European uh, cities. Seemed to be quite prosperous and people were well off and so on. And now it's collapsed with terrifying speed. Now you have a position in, in Greece where there are, there are uh, there's terrible poverty, there are schools without books, hospitals without drugs, pharmacies without medicines, and middle class people, formerly middle class people, rummaging around the rubbish bins in Athens looking for food. It's a, it's a terrible, ter terrible uh, state of affairs. Absolute, an absolute catastrophe. And there's no way out of this. Now, the European Union, the Germans and so on, are pressurizing the Greeks all the time, putting extreme pressure to cut and cut and cut. They said the Greeks are spending too much wealth. Ask the Greeks whether they're spending too much. They haven't got any money to spend. But the, the, the question about this, about the cuts, they all agree on that, austerity. That's the one thing they agree upon. There must be austerity. Yes, but you see, that won't solve the crisis. On the contrary, it's made the crisis worse. The more you cut spending and slash public services and so on, and cut old age pensions and the rest, well, you're reducing demand, aren't you? You're increasing unemployment. All they've succeeded in doing for the last three years is push Greece over a precipice, push Greece into a deep recession. There's mass unemployment, I think. Youth unemployment in Greece now, in Greece now somebody said it's about 55%, like in Spain. 55% of the young people are unemployed. 
But you see, if unemployment increases, work it out. Demand decreases. People are spending less. And taxation also decreases. Therefore, the deficit in Greece is not shrinking. As the end. On the contrary, the deficit will increase if they haven't got any tax revenue. Of course, the rich don't pay taxes. That's been exposed in Greece. There's a, it was a big scandal because uh, they've concealed the fact that the bankers and the ship, shipping magnates and the, to, the tourist millionaires and members of the government, both the, the ruling party and uh, the PASOK, have been uh, avoiding tax, paying tax, taxes. People know this. And that's the case in all, all countries. So Greece is a catastrophe, and there's no, no solution to this. I note that, uh, oh, by the way, uh, how many summit meetings that they had in Europe over the last three years? I've lost count. I can't remember how many. And every summit meeting was supposed to be a decisive summit. This is the final summit. This is going to, going to resolve the problem of the euro. They haven't resolved anything, actually. There was quite an amusing article in a right-wing paper called the Daily Mail here in England uh, last summer in which they said, well, this particular summit, it was last June, I think, this particular summit did not disappoint, summit of the, of the Euro, didn't disappoint. They, prom they promised that they would do nothing and they did just that. And that's about it. They haven't solved anything. It's true that Mario Draghi, who, by the way, is an Italian, and therefore that, I'm not surprised he's taken that position. Draghi's arguing, he's saying now that they're going to put all the resources behind the euro to save the euro. That's big talk, you know. He's got a big mouth, uh, Draghi. The trouble is that uh, talk will not solve the problem. The only way you could solve the, the euro, maybe, is if, if you put all the financial resources of Europe and had un unlimited credit. Unlimited support to combat the speculators and so on. Now, to my knowledge, there's only one country in Europe that could provide that kind of money. And that's the Bundesbank, that's the Germans. But the Germans are not very happy about this, I don't think. And there's complaints, uh, serious problems in Germany about paying any more money. And the argument, uh, uh, euro bonds is the other argument. Why don't have a euro bond? Sounds a very sensible thing, doesn't it, you know? Instead of individual governments guaranteeing their, their bonds and so on, well, why not have everyone to, to guarantee a euro bond for everybody? Well, you know, that's a bit like somebody said that. It's a little bit like, say, say you've got a, a, a credit card and you've got very good credit, as I have, as a matter of fact. I'm one of the few that does. I'm very careful what I, sp what I spend on the credit card. And your ne next door neighbour has got a very bad credit rating. So if I lend my credit card to my next door neighbour, what's going to happen to my credit rating? It's clear, isn't it? But that's what the Germans are being asked to do. And therefore, I don't think this is going to work. Spain is just one, one step behind Greece. You see, all these economies are linked. That's the problem. Now, we argued this years ago. We explained that under capitalism, you can't have a united Europe. The argument of a united Europe is false. Because you, can't, you cannot unite economies which are pulling in different directions. It can't be done. And therefore, they tried to do that. It did succeed for a while because the world economy was going forward. There was plenty of markets. There was no particular problem. But, of course, uh, we explained years, 20 years ago, we, we predicted, in the event of a deep slump, which you have now, all the national antagonisms would come to the fore, you know. And we actually predicted uh, in, in 1998, in a document called A Socialist Alternative to the, to the uh, European Union, we predicted that the, the euro at a certain stage would collapse amidst mutual recriminations. Well, the euro is on the verge of collapse at the moment, and there's certainly plenty of mutual recriminations. They're all linked together. You know, they can't be separated. The idea you could separate the Greek economy or separate Swiss, you cannot. It's a bit like uh, a group of, of, of mountaineers, you know, as you have in Austria. Mountaineers, they're all tied together, you know. There's a big fat guy up the front, he's the German, you see. And at the bottom of the, the line there's a little skinny uh, Greek chap, you know. Yes, but if the Greek falls off, you know what's going to happen, they'll all fall off. 
And they're linked together. They're, they're indissolubly linked. You can't separate them. And you see that now. You see with Spain. Now, Spain, the Spanish economy actually, a few years ago, had the highest rate of growth and the best results of any European country. And they, they created more jobs than anywhere, than anywhere else. Now it's turned into the opposite. The whole thing actually was based on a gigantic fraud, a gigantic swindle. As in, in America, <coughs> the um, subprime, uh, subprime uh, scandal, you know. It was a, a housing bubble, a housing boom. It was completely artificial. And now, of course, it's collapsed. With the result, house, house prices have collapsed. Thousands of families have been evicted and are threatened with eviction. Uh, there's whole cities. I was in Spain last summer. There's, there are whole cities in the centre of the country which are empty. Blocks of flats which are empty at the same time. Of course, there's a large number of people who have nowhere to live. That's the, that's the central contradiction of capitalism. Empty houses, empty flats, and people that have nowhere to live. That's, that's how it is. But, of course, there's a, the, the social effects are devastating, and he's seen the result. In Greece, there have been, what, about 20 general strikes in the last three years. Big demonstrations, occupations, fights with the police, and so on. In Spain, they're going in the same direction, and, and it will be even bigger in Spain, in my opinion. You know, with the revolutionary traditions of the Spanish people. You've had the Occupy movement, which is a symptom. I wouldn't put it stronger than that. It's a symptom because it's, uh, it's a mistake to think you can solve something just by occupying squares. More serious methods are, are required. But there's been a big movement of the miners, which had colossal sympathy throughout Spain. And my advice in relation to Spain is watch this space. The right-wing government is very unstable. And Italy, of course, then is only one step behind Spain. There's going to be a big blow. In, in Italy, there's an even bigger deficit, of course. The combined debt of, of Italy is, is, is almost approximately two, uh, two trillion uh, euros. And by the way, you know, they say, they say it, Italy is too big to fail. I say, yes, it's too big to fail. I also add, it's too big to save. You know, there isn't enough money in the, uh, in the kitty to, solve, to save Italy. So in other words, what I'm saying to you is nothing's been solved. Now, if you, if you add to that, they talk about a recovery. You know, they, all, all the hope was that the, with all these measures and all these trillions that they've, uh, they, they plowed in, that they were going to get a recovery. There's no recovery. On the contrary, I note that in the last uh, quarter of uh, 2012, Germany has gone down. And it's inevitable because where are they going to export to? They didn't think about that. I mean, if the whole of the Europe is depressed, if there's no market in the rest of Europe, where are they going to export their goods to? You know, so Germany is going going down. I don't know about Austria, but it's probably probably the same as Germany. Yes, you say that it is. France has gone down also. You know, it's a, well, Japan has gone down. In other words, there's no recovery. And in my opinion, they're heading for, for, for a further slump, an even deeper slump a bit further down the road. They were hoping that Asia was going to save them, China, you know, India. Not so. The Chinese economy is slowing down, fast. And now the reason for that is not difficult to understand. It's, it's not rocket science. Look, if Europe and America are not consuming, okay, then China cannot produce. Where are they going to export? To the moon? I suppose they could try. They've got, they've got rockets now, you know, but there's not much demand there either, as far as I know. If Europe and America are not consuming, Japan cannot produce. And if Japan, uh, not Japan, China cannot produce. And if China's not producing, well, that is an immediate effect on countries like uh, Australia, which is doing quite well up until recently. But where, where, where do they export their raw materials to? Brazil is also in, in difficulties as a result. Argentina, the same. You know, And therefore, it's a world crisis which they can't resolve. They haven't the faintest idea how to get out of this crisis. Now, the corollary is, since you ask about these, these social and political effects, 
Well, you know, Lenin said that uh, politics is concentrated economics, which is true. And I would put it this way, you can always express it as an equation. All the attempts of the ruling class, of the capitalists, to restore economic equilibrium will destroy the political and social equilibrium. And that is a fact. It is an empirically verifiable fact. You've got that everywhere. Crisis of government, crisis of society, crisis of politics. The class struggle is, is again entering into the, onto the scene. I'd go further than that. It's a crisis of the regime because the crisis affects every, everything. Every aspect of the establishment is affected, even religion. I see that the Pope has uh, resigned for the first time in 600 years. Well, that's not an accident, I think. Clearly, the Vatican is split. We've got all, all kinds of crises, uh, you know, corruption crises, corruption scandals, there's paedophile priests and cover-ups and so on. And, of course, the Roman Catholic Church was the glue, an important element of the glue holding together Italian society, so that's significant. We've had a crisis of the Anglican Church in Britain, which played a similar role in the past. Politicians, generally, distrusted, disliked. Nobody trusts them. Didn't used to be the case. Uh, in Italy you've got the rise of things like Pepe Grillo, who's a comedian, you know. I suppose the average Italian thinks, well, Italian politics is a circus anyway, so one more clown or one less clown doesn't make much difference. And then at least this clown makes some criticisms. The bankers used to be very uh, respected uh, figures in society. Now I think they're slightly less popular than serial killers and paedophiles. So, you know, it's, they hate it, in other words. The press also has been exposed. This big scandal in Britain, the, the Murdoch press. All the elements of the establishment are, are in a crisis. So what we, what, what, what we have here, I don't, wish to, I don't wish to exaggerate, but at the very least, you can say that we're moving in the direction of a crisis of the regime. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? You know, the, the, the main problem here is precisely a problem of leadership. There is such a crisis, and people, by the way, I think people are crying out for a change. You could even see that in the United States. A few years ago, the first time, when, when not this time, but the first time when Obama was elected, there were enormous hopes. People were queuing up. It was it was it was like in Caracas in an election campaign. You know, people and people in the states didn't use to vote. By the way, people in America did not do vote. And who can blame them? Because what the hell is the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans? You know, uh, the famous American writer Gore Vidal. I think he was. He, unfortunately, he died recently. But Gore Vidal was the greatest modern American writer, in my view. He, said, he put it rather well. He said, our republic is, has one party, the property party, with two right wings. You know, the Democrats said the Republicans, it's like one party. People didn't use to vote. But when Obama came across, and at least he, he seemed to be offering something different, people were queuing up from 3 o'clock in the morning. Not only black people, either all kinds of people, black people, white people, old, young, Hispanics as well. And if you ask these people why they were queuing, they, they'd, they'd answer the same question. They'd answer for the same answer. We're fed up of all this. We want a change. We must have a change. Of course, there was no change. But Obama, now people are disappointed. But you see, that's the point. It's an irony of history that precisely at this moment in time when the capitalist system is, is exposed as, as totally bankrupt, and when many people, not just political activists, but ordinary people, are really very angry about the bankers in particular and, so on, and the rich, there's a furious reaction. It's, re it's revealed in all the opinion polls, if you care to study them. Precisely at this moment in time, the leaders of the social democracy in particular, and, I'm sorry to say, the former so-called communists, the so-called left, have all abandoned the basic ideas of socialism and a socialist transformation of society and are clinging, it did beggar, it beggars belief, they're clinging to this skeleton, to this corpse 
You know, it's like a political necrophilia. They're clinging to this stinking corpse precisely when it's uh, falling to pieces. The market. The None of them raise the question of a fundamental change. Not one of them. Now, they think they're clever. They say that we are utopians. We're not utopians at all. They're the utopians. What's realistic about propping up this system? Which does not work. Manifestly, it does not work. Child of six could see that it doesn't work. And yet they're continually finding ways and means of propping it up. And therefore, what I would say is this, that, uh, you know, uh, if you accept the capitalist system, and that goes even some of the left, many of the lefts, most of the lefts, they accept the capitalist system as something given, something eternal, something which cannot be changed. If you accept the capitalist system, then as night follows day, you know, if you say A, you must say B, C, and D. As night follows day, they will have to obey the laws of the capitalist system. And the laws of the capitalist system now in, the, in this crisis are quite clear, are quite clear. When the right wing say, oh no, we must have us, we must cut living standards because we must increase profits to stimulate the economy. And so from their point of view, they're quite correct. It's indisputable. And therefore, the Social Democrats, if they have that position, and the so-called left, if they have that position, and they're put into power, it's even true of Greece as a matter of fact. If Syriza comes to power, and they don't carry out the socialist policy, I hope that they will. I support uh, a Syriza government. Yes, but if they don't carry out the socialist policy, they don't expropriate the bankers and capitalists and change the system fundamentally, then they will be forced, despite themselves, to carry out exactly the same policy of cuts. Now, I'll prove the point. François Hollande in France uh, was promising uh, something different. The pe people voted for him, thinking they'd be... They, they, by the way, there was a, they, it shows there's a big shift to the left. All over Europe, there's a big shift to the left. I don't agree with those people who say there's a danger of the right wing, the fascists, and so on. Maybe some, uh, some years down the line, if, if we suffer a series of defeats, maybe. But at this moment of time, there's a huge shift to the left. Look at France. There was a massive vote for, for the Socialist Party. Not just in the national elections, but in the town halls. I think they control everything now. And Sarkozy was heavily defeated, which is unusual. He was, he was smashed. Hollande was promising a change and against austerity, promising growth and so on and so forth. Yes, but what's happened in practice is predictable. He starts off trying to raise the taxes. You ask him about taxes. Well, I ask Mr. President Hollande. He tried to raise uh, the taxes on the rich. And what, what occurred? A flight of capital, of course. A flight of capital, sabotage. And now he's had to retreat. Now Hollande is carrying out an austerity policy in France. And, of course, there's a reaction against. He went to see uh, Merkel as soon as he was elected. She's the real boss. Theoretically, Europe is supposed to be run by a, a condominium of France and Germany, but uh, uh, it's nonsense. It's the Germans control everything. Germany decides. France is a secondary to power now, and they have to do what they're told. But it's quite amusing. They had a, they had a, a, a meeting between Hollande and Merkel, and Merkel stands for austerity, and Hollande stands for growth. So they reached an agreement. They got an agreement. You know what the agreement was? Growth with austerity. <laughs> no, it's a nonsense. It's a nonsense. And everywhere the Social Democrats are doing the same thing. Of course, by doing this, all that they will do is to do, they do the dirty work of the capitalists. And therefore they prepare the way for a further movement to the right. That's for sure. And people are disappointed. They will go to the right, of course. In the next, the following election, then you have even deeper cuts. And that, of course, has the advantages from the standpoint of the ruling class. They say, well, they say to the middle class in particular, you want socialism? There's socialism. You see what you had with the socialists? You're better off with us. No, no. In every single case, and it's an historical law, the social democrats prepare the victory of the right, always. Always.
it is patently obvious that on the basis of capitalism and on the basis of, of the dictatorship of the banks, because that's what you've got, no solution is possible. That, that must be made clear. And therefore, you know, what, what the conclusion flows from that. What I would advocate is the expropriation, nationalization without compensation or with minimum compensation according to need, you might say, but uh, in the case of the banks, I'd say without compensation straight away. Nationalization of the banks, the finance houses, and the big monopolies, supermarkets and so on. Um, not of everything. I wouldn't advocate nationalizing everything. This is a, a caricature of Marxism. We are not interested in the small bars and uh, cafes and so on. You've got very nice small cafes in Vienna. We leave, leave them alone. They do, they do a good job. And what's the name of those places? The Heurige, is it? Heurige, yeah. Heurige, they're very, very nice. We leave them in private hands for now, you know. We're only interested in the big ones, the supermarkets. Look, you've got this scandal now of um, adulteration of food. Horse meat and stuff, which is, uh, I mean, that, that's the least of all worries, is horse meat. You've got all kinds of chemicals and all kinds of nonsense and poison in, in our food. But the, the big supermarkets are responsible for that. The small farmers don't get a fair, don't get a fair deal. I know, I mean, I'm from Wales, I'm Welsh, and we, we, my wife and I spent the holiday in, in North Wales a few years ago. Welsh lamb is the best lamb in the world, but it's uh, wonderful. But it's quite expensive in the supermarket. And yet we were staying on a farm and the farmer said, look, do you know how much I get for that lamb? I said, how much? It's one pound for a whole lamb. He says, it's not worth my work. Some farmers kill them with shotguns because they can't afford the feed. So the farmer's being robbed and the consumer's being robbed. Okay. Somebody's making a profit. And it's the big supermarkets and there also the big transport firms and so on. So if you eliminate that, you get get rid of the middlemen. You can give a fair deal for the, for the farmer, which would be in favour of that, the small farmers. The big farmers should be expropriated, not the small farmers. And also for the consumer. So everybody gains in that sense. But above all, you see, by nationalising the, the key points of the economy, it would enable us to plan the economy. What you've got now is, is an unholy mess, a complete mess. I mean, it's criminal. What more criminal thing is in Spain? 55% of young people without work? What's the matter? Don't we need doctors in Spain? Don't we need uh, teachers in Spain? Don't we need engineers in Spain? I think we do. And in all other countries. The problem is that the capitalist system can't use the productive potential and the human potential which it's built up. What is required is a rational plan of production that will, will, will provide people, everyone with a job, with work. That, it's, that in itself would increase production and the wealth of society would increase enormously. Put everybody to work, that's the first thing. Build, say, a, a million houses a year, why not? Solve the housing problem. In all countries there's a housing problem. In Britain, people can't afford to buy houses anymore. It's, can't afford to pay the rents. Half of the wages go in rent. This, this is criminal. But the, and the sources and that will cease. Now look, you can say a lot of critical things about the USSR and so, so I'm not in favor of Stalinism and so on. But let's be clear about this. In the Soviet Union there was uh, no unemployment. It was a planned economy and uh, it was a crime to be unemployed as much. You know, everyone had a job, everyone had a house, the housing wasn't uh, of a, a, a very high standard, but you had a house with virtually f no rent and free electricity, free gas. Even in Moscow there was free telephone calls in the local area. Um, I mean, that, that, that's e that could easily be done with better quality furthermore. It could easily be done with a planned economy. Why shouldn't it be possible to plan the economy? I mean, I mean, every time I go into a supermarket, one of these big supermarkets like Tesco, I'm surprised. I don't know. Tesco can, can, can plan in such a way that they know exactly how many loaves of bread are needed in this area. It's a big area. Exactly how much milk is needed. Exactly how many tins of beans are needed. They know exactly. You know. 
Well, if, 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 you can, if you can have that degree of planning within the, in a supermarket, why can't you have it for the whole of society? Of course you can. It's entirely possible on one condition, that the basic levers of economic uh, control are in our, in our hands, in public hands. In the hands of the state, if you like, yes. Am I in favour of state uh, control? Well, of course I am, on one condition. The uh, industry and the banks must be in the hands of the state, but the state must be in the hands of the working class. We're in favour of complete democracy, of uh, Lenin's conditions, you know, that he introduced in 1917. And they're abolished under Stalin, that's another matter, but the idea was free and democratic election to all positions. Every single position must be elected with right of recall. You see, you don't have that now in the in a democratic country like Britain or Austria, you, you don't have the right, right of recall. You elect a government, once it's there, it's there. You can't get rid of it for the next four or five years. They're there. Even if they break all their promises. Now, under Lenin and Trotsky, that wasn't the case, you see. You know, you had right of recall. In other words, I elect you, but if you don't do what I want, then we, we, with, 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 with the less po least possible uh, formalities, you can be got rid of. Right of recall. The third condition is uh, limitation on the salaries of officials. No, no official, no bureaucrat, no banker should receive a higher wage than a skilled worker, say, than a doctor, maximum. And of course, uh, a, a worker's militia instead of the army, and so on, that's a separate uh, matter. Like they have in Switzerland, by the way. You know, want to know my model? Well, the Swiss model's not bad. Everyone should learn the, the use of arms uh, in, in an organized way, you know. Now, what's wrong with that? In other words, what I'm adv advocating is a real democracy, not the so-called democracy that you have in, in Britain, where in reality, you know, uh, everyone can say what they like, and even that is not quite true. Anyone can more or less say what they like, as long as unelected uh, groups of bankers and industrialists decide what actually happens. That's not democracy, that is, uh, it's a joke. And therefore, what we advocate is a genuine democratic socialist model. Now, what, what would that mean? Well, it would mean, for example, now, now for example, if they get 2 or 3% rate of growth, then they, they, they break out the champagne. It's a reason to celebrate. Two or three percent rate of growth is, is, is miserable. That's a pathetic rate of growth. The Soviet Union, uh, in, during the first five year plans, had a 20 percent rate of growth every year. No unemployment. It's true that they set, they set out on, on a low basis, that's true, but nevertheless, they had a 20, 20 percent yearly growth rate. No unemployment, no inflation, and no deficit, no budget deficit. They had a, a small surplus every year, as a matter of fact, despite the fact that they spent a colossal amount of money on investment, on education, on science, on culture, on health, and so on and so forth. So that's what, what is possible. Now let, let's, let's say that that's putting the, the, the level too high. Okay, 10% would be a minimum, I would say, for a country like Britain or Austria, France. A 10% growth per year would be entirely possible. This would mean that within 10 years, you would double the wealth of society. I mean, that's a, you're talking about a vast increase. Not cuts, not austerity. There's no need for any austerity. It's all nonsense, you know. We have the potential to create, uh, to vastly increase the, the, the living standards, the cultural level, the education, the health of the entire population. So we shouldn't be talking about cuts of any sort. We should be planning for enormous prosperity, which in turn, you see, leads us to another level. You know, the, in the Bible, uh, Jesus Christ said, man does not live by bread alone, and I agree with that. The purpose of socialism is not just to give everybody a job and a house and a reasonable standard of living, although that's, uh, that is important. Yes, but that's the, the very basis of, it, of things. That's not the aim of socialism, not the final goal. You see, with a planned economy, it would easily be possible to reduce the working day immediately, 
not to 30 hours, but to, to 20 hours a week. Working week, that is, not the working day. 20 hours a week, being entirely possible. And increased production. You know, how would you do this? Well, look, isn't it absurd that you've got millions of people unemployed, while those who remain at work are working longer hours than ever before? Isn't that absurd? What we would say is, if, the, if there's unemployment, share the work. Let everybody work and work less hours. Now that makes sense. That's a rational idea. Unfortunately, under capitalism, that, that just doesn't work like that. You know. you know, a few years ago, I was watching a, a program on television. It wasn't even uh, a political program. It was a scientific program, a medical program, about stress at work. And uh, the people on the program were doctors. And one person made, made a point, one doctor made a remark which uh, struck me, because stress now and nervous breakdown is, and depression, is, 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 it's, uh, it's like an epidemic. That reflects the crisis of capitalism. Also. But this doctor said the following, it, 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 the word stuck in my mind. He said, you know, there are more time-saving devices now available than in the whole of human history. And there is no time. It's true, isn't it? I mean, people are, the, the, the levels of stress, of anxiety and so on, are being piled on. Now, for example, uh, the same program showed, to give a few examples, the, the Nissan factory, in, uh, the Japanese factory in the north of England. There was a young man, I think he was 19 years of age, on the production belt, and uh, they would speed up the production belt. Uh, if you wanted to go to the toilet, you had to put your hand up, and some, like in school. And sometimes the foreman wouldn't allow you to go. So well, what do you do? You do it in your, your pants, I suppose. And this kid had a nervous breakdown. Okay. There's another example, because white-collar workers also are affected by this. It isn't just traditional industrial workers. There was a, 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 an office with a load of uh, women typing on a computer. And this woman stopped just for one moment and a message flashed on the screen. Why have you stopped work? Start typing immediately. She had a nervous breakdown. And this is going on all the time. Things like bleepers, pagers, mobile phones, laptops. It means that the working day can be increased uh, beyond all natural limits. You know, people become enslaved to the productive process. Now, this is not a, not a humane existence. Marx explains the reason for that in Capital. When you read the chapter on machinery and the working day, Marx explains that under capitalism, the introduction of new machinery, far from reducing the working day, always increases the length of the working day. Always. Because it's a big uh, outlay and the capitalist wants to get his money back but getting this machine to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know. So therefore, as long as, as long as the profit motive is what decides, then you will never get a satisfactory human existence. What we would say is that the introduction of modern machinery and technology, which we're in favour of, should serve to reduce the working day to a minimum expression, thereby freeing people to develop themselves physically, mentally, intellectually, spiritually, if you like. To give people that, mo that, that most precious of commodities, which is a spare time. You know, as Paul Lafargue once wrote a book about this called uh, The Right to be Lazy. The sacred light, the right to be lazy that should be in inscribed on our banner, you know. People must have the, the, the time to develop themselves, develop the humane relations between men and women, you know, and that people will be able to think and develop their intellect and their minds. As Aristotle explained that 2,300 years ago, he said in the Metaphysics, man begins to philosophize when the needs of life are provided. That's the real meaning of socialism. When Engels said that socialism is, is mankind's leap from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. 
This word freedom is bandied about when it becomes meaningless. Real freedom is the freedom from slavery, the slavery of work, you know, such that you can develop yourself freely as a human being. That's what socialism means. But the prior condition for that, of course, is the abolition of capitalist slavery. Well, Europe is a, 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 an historically evolved entity. There is a European identity. Europe should be united. I mean, for too long, Europe has been the scene of wars and conflicts and senseless conflicts and barbarism. We're in favour of the unity of Europe. Yes, but on a capitalist basis, that is not possible. The whole experience of uh, the European Union demonstrates that. And by the way, it's entirely possible, in my view, that the euro will collapse. It's entirely possible. Not certain, because they might just manage to pull things together. But it will, will, will not survive in its old form anyway. And in any case, uh, the whole thing is, is breaking down. Far from eliminating nationalism and chauvinism and racism, they've enormously increased. You know, People should be free to move around. Before the First World War, that was the case, by the way. Passports and so on, uh, visas, it's a recent thing. Didn't have that in the past. In that sense, there's less unity now than what there was in Marx's day. You could move more freely at that time than what you can now. No, we're in favour of European unity. Yes, but it's got to be on the basis of socialism. That is to say, look, if the Greek workers were to take power, let's say if Syriza, if Tsipras had a, a socialist policy, a genuine socialist policy, would take power in Greece and then appeal to the workers of Spain, of Italy and France to follow his example, as Lenin and Trotsky did in the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. Just think of the impact that that would have. I think it would have a far bigger impact on people's minds than the Russian Revolution of 1917. And therefore, it would be possible to, to unify Europe on the basis of a common socialist plan of production which would pool the resources. Now just imagine that. Europe has got huge resources, not just, not just of industry, but agriculture, which they can't use. I'll give you one example. Look, olive oil is very nice. It's very good for you. It's very tasty for food, you know. It's very good for your health. They're tearing up. It takes a long time to create an olive tree, by the way. It takes many, many years. They're tearing up the olive trees. Olive groves that have been there for hundreds of years in Spain. Why? Well, it's too much olive oil. How can there be too much olive oil? It's ridiculous. There's too much olive oil for the narrow limits of the capitalist system. On a socialist basis, a socialist economy, you wouldn't have barbarous things like that. There would be a free flow of goods, of services, of people. Frontiers would cease to exist. Frontiers are barbarous things. Frontiers should be con con consigned to the, the museum of, of antiquities, you know, of fossils. People should be allowed to, to, to mingle freely. Yeah, but that, that would be possible on the basis of full employment, no shortage of, of houses and resources. That also would cut the ground from under the question of racism. You know. The last part of the reason for racism is the fact that there's not enough work, there's not enough houses, there's not enough health services, to go around and therefore people begin to fight like animals for, for, on the basis of scarcity. Socialism would abolish that scarcity. There's no reason for it to exist, no, no rational reason, on the basis of the existing uh, productive capacity. This is not utopian, it's on the basis of what, what actually exists now, which they cannot use, that's the point. We would put all these productive resources to, 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 to work in a, in a planned way for the satisfaction of human needs, not private profit. Well, uh, to conclude, I, I think that uh, it is clear that uh, mankind, humankind, is now uh, in a turning point in which we have to decide. People have to make their minds up that uh, it is necessary to put an end to this system which has outlived its usefulness, which is completely senile, reactionary, retrograde and so on, and take into their hands the running of society. 
Yes, but that presupposes a serious struggle. One can say that uh, at the present time, the old society is dying on its feet. The new society is struggling to be born. Yes, but that can be quite a painful and prolonged process. It is therefore up to us, up to the Marxist, to do everything in our power to shorten this uh, process, to make it less painful, to make it less difficult. And the way that one does that is by fighting within the organizations of the working class for the only program and policy that can succeed. That is to say, the ideas of Marxism, the marvelous ideas, the profound ideas of scientific socialism, which were worked out over 150 years ago and which have never been more relevant than at the present time. And therefore, in conclusion, I would like to appeal to all of you to the workers, the youth in particular, to assist us in the building of a Marxist alternative, to help us in the building of the international Marxist tendency, and to participate in the only cause which is worthwhile to sacrifice and struggle for in the 21st century, that is to say, the sacred cause for the emancipation of the working class and the victory of socialism on a world scale.